and welcome to the show for the 22nd of May. Uh, welcome to the Trolley World Logic Show, They're their special guest, and we'll get on to him in a quick second. Uh, I'll just like to introduce the team for tonight. With me, as always, is the Kitch. Hey, guys. And uh, joining us for this special guest, Womble, well, not so special. Oi, oi, I resent <laughs> that, Mark, <laughs> remark. Um, again, as with last night, I've not got my headset with me, so if at any point you hear typing um, sounds from me, I apologise. There also might be occasional chewing sounds if I get too close and I'm, and I'm eating. But I'm going to be trying to be good. Okay. And welcoming uh, well, a special guest is Sound of Silence. Hello. I'm, wel- I'm happy to admit that I'm special. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and, and our very, very, very special guest, Martin Wagner of the Atheist Experience. Thank you. I'm actually only occasionally special, so hopefully this is one of those occasions. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just to get quick announcements out the way, Kitch, we're going to a charity show coming up on the 7th of July. We have some guests confirmed. I think you can, well, you would like to announce one of them? Uh, I would. Uh, one of the guests we have confirmed, and I'm very, very uh, excited to have, is uh, Coughlin616. Yes, and he's going to be interviewing a very mild-mannered and wonderful Demax man, isn't he? Yes, uh, I can only imagine the civilised conversation that will be taking place during that hour. Yes, and I think, Womble, you can announce the section you're going to be taking part in. Um, yeah, I'm going to be moderating the um, uh, debate, as it were, between um, Martimer and Bionic Dance. It's the so there will be massive, massive geekage. Yeah, it's the battle of the nerds there. And who else have we got? And... Big Lundy has confirmed a whole heap of guys I can't remember right now. Das American Atheist is one of them. And we've also got Confession with Brother Dominic, also known as Gokster. Excellent. Yeah, so all be good fun. And like I said, it's all for uh, Joe Zemecki's charity, Atheists Helping the Homeless. Uh, it's a very good cause. I think you're quite aware of it as well, Martin. I think you're quite active with it. Uh, yeah, I haven't been uh, as active with it. It's, it's really Joe's thing, but I've yeah. been very supportive of it, and it's a terrific thing he's, do, he's doing. Yeah. It really is. All right. Uh, so we do have a caller on the line who says you've, she's spoken to you before. So Uh-oh, can... I didn't do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there. So, it wasn't uh, me. The, the photographs are faked. Yeah. Uh, the, the witnesses were bribed. It wasn't me, I so, promise. So um, the option is, do you, do you want to go to caller or... Do you want to speak? What's the verdict? Up, up to you, up to you. Okay, we'll, we'll go with the caller. I would normally be talking, but I'm currently devouring a barbecue rib. <laughs> You're always eating on this show. Yeah. I'm not always eating. <laughs> this is my tea. This show starts as ignorant than ours. Yeah, apparently they haven't accepted have our contact kids. request, so we can't add them yet. So I think we'll just uh, we'll speak to Martin for a bit until they get their issues sorted out. And... Uh, could someone talk? I need to speak to the caller to let them know what to do. So, Kitch, could you take over for a second, please? Uh, sure. Uh, Martin, how did you get involved in the Atheist Experience uh, web, uh, the show? Well, it started, uh, it doesn't seem like this long ago, but it really was right around the end of the 90s. I think 90, no, it was 99, actually. And um, I had been in Austin for several years, but I had no idea there was even an atheist group. I mean, I was familiar with American atheists who, uh, you know, when Madeline was alive, they had their base in Austin. It all happened one day when I was uh, just at my apartments and uh, getting my mail, as a matter of fact, and a fellow um, came up to me, and he had noticed that I had a Darwin fish on the back of my car and um, introduced himself and uh, asked, are are you... So, are you an atheist or what? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, more or less. And um, he said, well, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, I, I'm part of this group here in town, this local organization, Atheist Community of Austin, and we do uh, a cable access television show. And I said, you have to be kidding me. And he said, no, no, we do it. And so we talked for a bit, and I, I, I promised that I would watch when I had a, a chance. And a couple of weeks went by, and I and I remembered this, and I, and I did. I actually tuned in, and at that time it was... Um, it was on on Sunday mornings, so it was opposite all the church programming. And I, I remember uh, watching, and the very first uh, thing I saw was Jeff D. ranting like mad. Uh, and, and I thought, this is brilliant. I can't believe this even exists. This is absolutely wonderful. So I kept watching. I kept watching. And um, 
And then a few days later, I uh, met the fellow outside. His name was Howard Jones, I believe. And he's actually he's, he's actually over from uh, he was from Scotland actually. So he had uh, anyway he, he well we we became friends and I uh, he invited me to the studio one morning to, uh, to to view the taping and and participate and so I did. I went with him early one morning and I met everybody. And at that time, and this was before everything was automatic and digital, so uh, I eventually ended up working the other camera. It was a three camera setup, and there were two of them there. And so I started doing camera stuff because I'm a film TV guy. And then I just got a bit more involved with it. And the very first show, so see, the way the show used to be, it's, it's very different now. Uh, we have this global audience, which is wonderful. I mean, from YouTube, and, and you know, and, and in fact, I'm talking to you folks, and it's, it's just been great. And it's been very, you know, very much a privilege to to see how the show has grown and grown and grown, and to to be part of it. Um, but back then, we were just a little local cable access TV show, and our audience, we had no idea who was watching or if anyone was. But it was pretty much a safe bet that if you were watching and you were an atheist, it was because you were an atheist community of Austin member and you knew us personally. And if you weren't an atheist, it was because you were some hapless Christian who was channel surfing that day and stumbled upon <laughs> our program. And we're like, what in the hell is this? And so we got, actually back then, a great deal more angry Christian callers than we do now, as a matter of just people calling up, just wondering who we are and what we were doing and why do we have a show and what's it all about and... Um, nowadays we have this, uh, the, you know, this large worldwide atheist audience, and so we kind of we we have to really, really encourage the theists to call. Um, so back then it was it, we we were flying by the state of our pants. We had no idea what we were doing, uh, but we were uh, but we knew that we were you know it was a, it was a thing that we believed in. We uh, um, the, it was doing this kind of new media outreach was relatively new. I mean, American Atheists had its media, its television show, and its media that it did. Uh, but the reason that Atheist Community of Austin started at all was because uh, the group was started by a woman uh, in 1997 named Kellen Van Hauser. And uh, her real motivation was that there was no uh, there was no local atheist group. American atheists had much bigger fish to fry. They wanted to do things on the national stage. They weren't really interested in just... You know, local events, things that were interesting, of interest to just the local community, folks who wanted to meet, uh, you know, on a smaller scale. So, ACA was founded for that reason, and from there we just decided, well, why not do some things? And you know, so nonprofits got going right around the time iTunes started doing podcasts. Uh, you know, we really tried to sort of get out there and outreach with atheism in a way that we didn't really see it being done a whole lot, or at least we didn't know of because. You know, YouTube wasn't a thing back then. You know, Skype wasn't around. You know, blog TV. So there's a, blogs were not really were, were only just starting up. So we were just experimenting. But um, you know, I kind of I kind of came in and and we all figured it out as we went. We made it up as we went. But uh, here we are, many years later. So I guess we did something right. If I can ask, what was it like for you personally in the early stages? Was it something of a dirty little secret that you had to keep from certain friends, or um, did you get a lot of harassment for it in terms of either personal stuff or through the post or anything like that? Not so much, because, um, well, Austin, for, for one thing, it's a, compared to the rest of Texas, it's a, it's a rather progressive town, so... Um, didn't really get too much harassment or disapproval on the local level. I think most of my personal friends knew that I was especially religious. Um, my atheism is a thing that, with my parents, my family, you know, we sort of agree not to discuss. You know, I'm very close to them, and um, <clears throat> they they are a Christian. They're not hyper fundamentally so. You know, they're not uh, from the Ray Comfort School. But their beliefs mean a lot to them, and so, you know, in the interest of not having any unnecessary risk, because I'm really close to them, uh, I like that we, they just don't talk about religion much to me. I mean, Mom will every once in a while say something to the effect that, you know, she's praying for me, but that's about as far as it goes, and I don't really mind that. But in terms of any sort of uh, negative impact on my personal life, I really didn't experience much. <clears throat> Okay, I think we've got the caller sorted out, so we'll add them in. So 
Um, just quickly while we're getting the caller in, uh, Stephen Tennessee uh, says, ask Martin if they've ascertained the actual identity of Shock of God. I'm not sure whether that's something you'd be allowed to would want to say in a public forum, but you can either answer that or not answer it. Actually, I don't. I don't exactly think his real name is a, is a profound trade secret or anything. I think a lot of people know who he really is. I don't know his name offhand. But, yeah, he's really just nothing but a trash-talking YouTuber. He claims that he <laughs> program. He's, he's never called our program live. You know, he claimed that he called the show and essentially completely owned Matt on this ridiculous question that he has, which is, um, you know, provide so evidence. No, oh, not proof yeah. and evidence. Yeah, exactly, oh. correct. Okay, I'll add the caller in now. Sub Zero Bob. I don't know. Sub Zero Bob. Sub Zero Bob, okay. Hello there, you're on the show. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, what's, Excellent. What's your question? Um, it's just uh, I was talking to Martin last week. Uh, not last week, but two weeks ago on the atheist experience. And it's just kind of like... Um, how do you say? Oh, I think I remember you. Yeah. yeah, this is Bobby. Hey, Martin. Oh, hi. Uh, there's a kind of a delay. I don't understand why I'm not hearing myself twice, but uh, um, it's, I'm new to this. Yeah, yeah, you need to mute your blog TV. Yeah, have you got the volume up on your blog TV right now? If you do mute it, just turn it right down. That'll be the reason. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, volume. How about I just turn off the whole thing? <laughs> Alright. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll just leave Skype on now. Yeah, that'll work probably as well. Alright. So, um, Martin, um, it's just last week when we spoke, or two weeks ago when we spoke, I was honestly quite offended that you think that um, I was trying to lecture you on science. I'm not a scientist. All I was trying to point out was that 35% of the scientific community has an appreciation for a higher um, uh, being or entity. And what I'm trying well, to, now where do you to get say... That figure? Where, do, where do you come up with that figure? Because... I, I was, no, I was watching... I was watching Tyson... Sun. I was watching Tyson. He's a renowned scientist, and I'm, I'm getting his figures from them, from him. And the point is that, it, you know, I'm a regular Joe. I'm a regular guy, and and I'm relying on scientists a lot. And if if scientists can't figure that out on, on by themselves, then then that's my problem with it. It's 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 not because I'm saying I'm a scientist and and I know how the science works, and I'm trying to lecture you on science. No, that's not what I mean. What I, what I was trying to do is, tr is point out philosophically uh, to you that there's some something, some disconnect, some reason plus that's that's happening that even people of the scientific world are are getting um, you know down the track of, of that um, you know appreciation well, for godlike off, entity. Well, first off, let's, it, it it doesn't matter. Okay. I am well aware that there are theistic scientists who exist, right? So Kenneth Miller, who is one of the world's leading evolutionary biologists, is also a practicing Catholic. You know, these are not mysteries that there are scientists who believe in a god. What matters is when they are expressing their theistic beliefs, they admit that these are their theistic beliefs, and they admit that they don't have science backing them up, but it is still their personal belief, even though they are scientists, that there may or may not, that there may be a god, right? Now, I don't know, again, as far as your per, your figures are concerned, uh, you know, uh, what I'm looking at right now is um, you know, our figures that are on Stephen Jay Gould's uh, website, where um, according to the National Academy of Sciences, uh, the, the figures as of 1998 are 7% uh, of uh, scientists uh, or members of that organization have a, a belief in a personal god, uh, seventy six point seven have a personal disbelief, and twenty three point three percent profess doubt. So, I think that by and large, when you 
the more educated you are in the scientific method, in the whole process of inquiry that that entails, and you begin to learn things about how the universe actually works, the less and less you find it necessary to rely upon supernatural explanations for phenomena in nature. Um, does this, however, preclude a personal belief that someone, a, even a practicing scientist, may have on philosophical grounds or on cultural grounds? Well, no, it doesn't. But when it, simply to say, well, X percent of scientists do believe in a god, and therefore I think it should be valid, that right there is you know, really just uh, an argument or, or the appeal to authority fallacy. You know, because a person is X, um, therefore we should take their views seriously on every subject, even if those views don't necessarily have anything to do with their particular, you know, field of expertise. Like, it would not be an appeal to authority fallacy if you were to, you say, a certain biologist has this to say about how biology works. But it would be uh, an appeal to authority fallacy to say, you know, well, uh, certain biologists... Uh, tells me that I should. this is what I need to do to fix my transmission, and I shouldn't listen to my actual mechanic. And so because that guy's a brilliant scientist, I think I'll listen to him, right? Yeah, if I, if I may respond, there's like other things that are, that are bothering me too is, is this, that if an average Joe is faced with a scientist, it's very easy for a scientist to just tell, hey, look, you got to trust me what I'm saying is true because I got more education than you, and I've studied these things, and I can just tell you right off the bat: there's no, there's no God, and you just got to take my word for it. And then I have. I to think an scientist who would be doing that would, uh, would for one thing, not be giving you a scientific opinion because if a scientist uh, were to say, "Here is my position on a particular thing," and you you asked him, "Please show me your work. Please show me your evidence," he'd do it. That's how scientists operate. That's the whole scientific method. Uh, any scientist who said, but, I'm a scientist... Would, would, it, would you God agree that it's an should, opinion in, in, that I wouldn't even understand what he is trying to, to show me, that I'll still find faults of what, no matter what it is just because of my faith? And now, when we go back to the car example, the used car example, it bothers me a lot too because um, when you were talking about here's the used car, you taking the leap of faith rather than taking it to the mechanic. The thing is, I am taking the car to the mechanic before I buy it. I'm not stupid. You know, and I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm listening to this scientist. I'm listening to that scientist. I listen to a lot of scientists, and I've, I'm pretty much stuck on one scientist right now, and that's uh, uh, Neil Tyson. And and it just it, it it is something like Reason Plus. And that was Matt. He said Reason Plus in a in a conference in a, in something I watched on YouTube. There is something more than reason that that is in play, and we're missing the whole picture if we don't talk about well, like, that like plus what? factor. What, what, is, what is this thing, what is this process that mm -hmm. is not reason, that functions beyond reason, that is a better means of obtaining knowledge and facts about the universe than reason, and how does that work exactly? How do you apply it? I mean, you know, how do, you, a, how do you use it to, to evaluate evidence and make decisions as to whether or not claims are true? Okay. Um, the... There's so many things that I can tell you right now, but the, okay, the bottom line. The, all right, the bottom saying? line is one word: mystery. The bottom line is mystery. How do we arrive at the essence of truth? How how is this? I can am I being on this a little. Okay. Um, I was going to say we're actually in a position with um, sort of trolling logic and skeptic TV that we do have either some people with scientific qualifications or are very near to completing their scientific qualification, uh, qualifications. And I'm <clears throat> one of the people with um, scientific qualification. I've got a degree in geology. I'm currently pursuing various types of additional study, including a master's degree. Um, and I've got to say, with what, what Martin was saying earlier about the studying of science, is you do get an appreciation for how unlikely it is um, that there was any sort of divine inspiration or you know, cr uh, creator, as it were, behind universe, I mean, particularly if I look at things in terms of geology, with the, the knowledge I've got, I can sit back and I can appreciate the processes that are going on to shape the planet um, and all the other planets in the solar system, and an appreciation of uh, potentially how the planets have formed as well. And it is literally the sort of thing where I wouldn't necessarily turn around and arrogantly say that God doesn't exist, but at the same time, it is, as Martin was saying, it's my opinion, personally, 
that the existence of a god is very unlikely. We don't have any evidence either way to say whether or not a god exists. But it's certainly from all the science I've seen and from most of the science people I know and talk to, the, the, the common opinion is that you know science can't say for sure if there's a god, but at the same time, that there's probably no need for a god to form. And, and, and you have to look at it in terms of uh, the basic scientific principle of falsifiability. You have to know what you're looking for. If you're going to suggest, all right, well, perhaps a god is responsible for X, Y, Z, or well, let's just say the universe in toto, right? Well, then you have to ask yourself, what would a non-god-designed universe look like? That's how you. That's that's the falsifiability question. You come up with a hypothesis, and then you say, well, what conditions would we expect to see? if this hypothesis were not valid. And I've never managed to find a, uh, for example, say someone, I'm not saying that you're necessarily a creationist, but let's say a, a, uh, you know, a traditional creationist or even part of the intelligent design camp, which made the rounds over in this country and really pissed everyone off for a few years. It's, you know, what exactly is it that are you, are you, what exactly are you proposing and how would we falsify that? Because well, um, okay. one of the, one of intelligent designs biggest points that they wave around as if it's a point in their favor is that evolutionary biology is a theory, like evolution by natural selection is a theory that has gaps. There's a lot of gaps. And the more gaps there are in your theory, then the worse your theory is. That's the premise that they're working on. And then their technique is to try to punch holes in, say, evolutionary biology by showing the gaps. The problem with ID is, what are they offering as an alternative? And what they are offering as an alternative is one big gap that is larger than the universe. You know, so when you talk about mystery, yes, we seek to solve mysteries using the scientific method and using our reason. But what happens when we have mysteries is we don't simply say, well, look, there's mystery, so there must be some other process that we are not aware of by which we either solve these mysteries or they just get to remain mysteries to us and somehow that makes everything but, I don't but know, there more is, interesting. There is another can. process. There is another process and it's philosophy. And for me, philosophy is even more important than science itself because science cannot take and put in tube the being of me, which is I am, which is the only thing I cannot deny. And the fact that I exist is the fact that I can deny myself. You know, it's the basic uh, philosophic argument, mm. what I'm getting but, at. But in a practical, but science deals with practical matters, right? How, and on a practical sense, is, I mean, I understand that philosophy perhaps has a utility, um, although I don't know that I, I mean, while it, it may be interesting, my, my personal point of view is that I don't really see any reason to believe a claim is true until I see the evidence for it, regardless of what a philosopher right, might but, say. But that's on a practical point. sense, and, how, how is philosophy better than science at, at finding out simple basic facts about how the universe works. How, do we, how would we have applied philosophy to searching for you know, a cure for smallpox or cancer or polio? How would we have applied philosophy to, boy, there's a big wide ocean between uh, America and England. Instead of taking ships, wouldn't it be nice if we could fly? How do you apply philosophy to a lot of these practical matters that affect our day-to-day -day lives? I understand that it is an interesting – and uh, Lawrence Krauss has actually uh, recently, you know, because he kind of caught some flack from people who are philosophically minded and backed up saying, look, I understand that this is perhaps a, uh, a, uh, a practice that has some very interesting utility in terms of trying to think about – questions that seem as if they might be outside the purview of science, uh, questions that deal with <clears throat> meaning, for example, uh, you know, uh, things, that, things that affect you on perhaps a, a personal level. But when it comes to finding out facts, I, I don't see a better method than reason and science. Right. You, can, uh... you can equate both. You have to use science for certain things that science works best, and you have to use philosophy for other things that philosophy works best for. And when you when you combine both of these is when you get the whole picture, for me at least. And but you can't just rely on one thing and, and completely dismiss another. Even when you're saying you're a skeptic, you're so-and-so percent a believer. So in a, in a sense, you How don't you really are a percent atheist if, you're, if you say that you're a skeptic because you're not dismissing the fact or the possibility that there might be a god. 
Well, I if don't I could just go ahead, I'll let the rest of the chat here. Um, a skeptic Sorry. is looking is someone that wants to see an evidence based approach. You, if you want me to turn around and <clears throat> accept that there is the existence in a divine being of any nature, it doesn't have to be the Christian God, then you've got to show me some manner of proof that can be verified before I'll turn around and say, yeah, no, you're right, I'm going to start praying now to this deity. Hey, we're, not, we're not saying oh, no. that we won't. You, pray you to can just really stop praying to any, any deity. That, that, that is your own personal choice, and mm-hmm. that is the problem if you start believing there is a personal God. Then, then I'm not even talking about those kind of people. That's the reason why I'm calling you guys, because you have, beyond the reasonable doubt, dismissed the fact that there's a personal God. And I, I see that myself, and it's I'm not calling... It's not beyond calling... reasonable doubt dismissal. I've studied geology for about eight or nine years' worth of study at various points. I earn my living based on my scientific knowledge, okay. which I've gained not, through this thing. I'm just, all and I'm saying is I don't believe in personal God either, and I don't have to believe because I'm not stupid. Okay, you know, and what what I'm trying to tell you is it's entirely different thing. And what I'm saying is, um, where does I am exist? I am, I exist, I am a spirit. Where is that I am exist? Can you put it in I a test tube? To take, Can you? I think you're trying to take a trip down to the sophistry route, which is something I personally don't find entertaining, as it were, because... You have to make a basic assumption with science, and that is that the world as we experience it is real. And that is an assumption. If we went off and um, tried to question that, we'd end up going down matrix arguments. I'm not talking about about whether or not the world is real. I'm talking about existence um, of of a philosophical philosophical term of, of me, of I am, and trying to put that in a test tube to prove that I am has... Um, in existence. The only way well, is if I start typing right me. now, and you get the only way is if I manifest my myself through typing, and I say I am, and I'm just gonna click enter right now, and you're gonna see it. That's the I am in the physical, but you can't take that into a test tube. The fact that I am, no, and I'm okay, denying look, myself. Uh, let me let me let me chime in here really quickly. No offense, but it seems to me that if. Uh, you know, if if this process, uh, philosophical process that you're describing, has provided you with such good answers uh, to, or at least uh, such a good method to finding out the answers to these questions, seems to me you'd be able to describe it a little bit better. I'm sorry, uh, but yeah. it's it, it it really doesn't. You know, are, I I see really no it's reason to think to me, that my it's mind. A Yes, but I, I really don't see any reason to think that our minds, our, our intellectual processes, our thought processes, are anything more or need to be anything more than you know chemical reactions in our brains that uh, you, uh, you know that that are produced uh, you know physically. You know that this notion of of, of, of say Carte- Cartesian dualism or whatever you want to call it that the mind is, is is some sort of magical inexplicable property and therefore it simply cannot be. Uh, Solely produced by you know this squishy piece of meat in our skulls. Um, I mean, I understand there's there's a, a wishful thinking aspect to that, but I, why couldn't it be? And but it's it's a point you know, of view. Where, where are there where are there any where, examples? Where are that's there any where we examples? Point of view. Yeah, I mean, where are there any examples that you can find of a mind that exists independently of a brain? Right. I mean, if you, if you had your head blown clean off by a shotgun, your mind would not still be now wandering in the ether going, well, darn, I lost my physical vessel, but at least I'm still around and, you know, because I am independent of the brain that I was in. I don't think you'd well, see... Uh, yeah, so why I don't know it, of any why actual examples. Be, the truth, why wouldn't that be the truth? Well, you won't be able to because there won't be anything to connect to. You know... Uh, Yes, and what is, what is the difference? What is the difference between something that you cannot observe because there's no physical thing to connect it to and something that simply doesn't exist? Mm, you lost me. I don't know. Okay. It's a point of, um, the point of view. It's a point of if, view, if you're, that's all. If, if you were saying that it, it ought to be possible for a mind to exist independently, independently of a brain, even though if such a mind existed, we would not have a means of detecting it because it was not linked to a physical brain, then why assume that the mind still exists at all, right? What's the difference between a mind that you cannot 
interact with, communicate with, identify, you know, study, and one that simply does not exist. I would also say that if there is such a mind that is existing somehow but no one has no way of interacting with the physical world, what's the point of even accepting that um, possibility? Because if we have no way of interacting with this mind, it might as well not exist because it's not beyond our ability to comprehend and interact with. It's because it, it's, it's part of the whole picture. And also another thing is it's a point of opinion and that's exactly what I was going to talk about as far as selecting the therapy uh, video of Unbeliever. Um, what, what the guy is talking about in that video is, is um, I don't belong in this world, I don't belong in the next one. From a religious point of view, he's saying that he, he'd rather go to hell than to believe in, in Christianity or whatever his religion he's coming from. But there's also another video from therapy which explains it much better, the point of view, and that's called Turn. And and it, it, that band is an amazing band, and it just it's one of the reasons why you got me to call today because I've been following therapy since 1994 or before, and it was one of the bands that I grew up on, and I understand this this problem with Christianity, and the the song turn in itself is anti-religious song, which is absolutely great and fine with me, but it also is a theistic song, and I'm just and, wondering, and is feeling, there a point of call in your I'm question? Because you seem to, you, I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to be rude, but you seem to be doing an awful lot of rambling at the moment. Yeah, you're well, not really I, getting I'm to, to say it's, yeah. Yeah, and we do it's a point. It's a feeling, it's a feeling that I get, it's a feeling that I get, it's a feeling that I get that I'm not getting the whole picture okay, when so we're talking about Okay, so it's a feeling that you get, fine. Well, that's all it is. As long as you understand, that's all it is. You could study philosophy, science, whatever it is, but that might help you um, try and quantify this feeling. Yeah, and we you don't okay. need to have to do it formally. But, I, but what, I'm, what I mean is, I'm on a journey here, and I'm, I'm giving you guys the benefit of a doubt, but for me, it's just not cutting it, because it seems like it's a two-dimensional thing for you guys. Uh, just get this physical thing in a, in a CAT scan or put it in an MRI machine and find it. But I, it, think it, 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 I, I don't think... That I will arrive. I will arrive to truth that way. I don't think I will arrive to the essence of meaning that way. I don't think I will get uh, the beauty of music and understanding of therapy. Science can tell us. <clears throat> uh, I just want to chip in here and to say this this two dimensional approach actually does have some real tangible results. It's the process that we got some great discoveries such as vaccines, antibiotics. Uh, very. Um, we're going down the road of cancer therapy. No, I'm, I'm not dismissing that. I'm not dismissing that. I'm not saying. I'm. I'm. I'm just trying to get to the to the bottom of it. I'm trying to get to the to the ultimate truth of existence. And um, I'm not dismissing that science has hundred percent come up with like the most in, uh, the reasons why we, no, we I still exist. I, I get it. You're, you're making an, You're making a, a very familiar appeal to. It's called the appeal to other ways of knowing. Um, I, I, until I see that those other ways of knowing are things that do a better job at getting us to actual knowledge than the scientific method, which is a tried and true method. Its methods have been shown to be effective in learning things about the universe. You know, in, in, until then, I, I don't really know that I see a whole lot of utility or any real reason to take these other means of knowing all that seriously. He, 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 let alone the fact that I've never heard a coherent definition of, of the methods of these other ways of knowing from people who insist that they simply must exist, like yourself. Yeah. Anyway, we okay. do have another caller on the line. I think there was a few questions. Oh, well, I was just going to say another thing about... Yeah. Well, um, if you make, just make one more point, and you know, we need to move on, because we do have people... The, the, my biggest point is that atheism is taking a hard stand, and if... if if, if that's not what scientists in, in history have done, most scientists in history have always come to a point where they say, okay, you know what, there's a God. Atheists, well, first off, that's not, again, that's just, okay. that's, that's you making another, another unsupportive claim to say that, you know, all, all scientists throughout history have eventually come, you don't know that any more than anything else, so please don't make claims about things you don't know. Secondly, atheism did, is not necessarily watch. a hard stand. Atheism is simply the rejection of theistic claims. I am entirely, I am entirely willing to recant my atheism should I receive 
anything in the way of credible evidence that a god exists. But it's going to take evidence. It's not going to take this wishful thinking, flighty appeal to other ways of knowing, and oh, there must be something more, etc., etc. This is uh, it, it, this is just all this kind of empty spiritualist talk that sounds really nice, it sounds really profound, but it's bereft of anything that's uh, substantial. It's it's just uh, ultimately it's a lot of wishful thinking and pissing in the wind, and I don't buy it. I give me a reason to buy it, it, it show me the evidence that it works, and I'll and I'll it adopt it. But until stand. then. Yeah. You know, until Atheism then, I will continue is a hard to stand. Just... Right. Atheism is a Atheism hard stand is... by saying there is no God. Yeah. That is Atheism a hard stand. A... Hey, okay. hey, listen to me carefully. <laughs> try, try to absorb this. Atheism is the disbelief in God. It is not the categorical rejection of gods because atheism, since we are rationalists and since we do apply the scientific method to our lives, means that if I encounter any evidence that a God exists... I will change my mind. So in that regard, it is not a hard stand, unlike the hard stand you see taken by theists who refuse to accept science, refuse to accept evolution, no matter how much evidence you actually rub their faces in. I do not know very many, if any, atheists who take this intractable, dogmatic, hard stand that there is not, cannot be, and will in no way, shape, or form could possibly be a god. Okay? There's I think it's probably time that we moved atheists. on. Yeah. There's plenty of hard atheists on YouTube. There's yeah. plenty of hard atheists everywhere. I feel bullied every day for saying I'm a taste. taste. I, I'm all over the place just well, struggling with this. Well, maybe better explaining your point of view yeah. than you know, if you don't want to be treated that way. Because but really, you're not very I, good I'm at it. Okay, uh, I'm encountering a blindness. I'm encountering a blindness of, of the origins of reason, uh, uh, processes of reason or order. And if you said you said if there was a, a God, would it create a, another different type of uh, universe? Well, for me, the only if there was no God, there would be uh, no existence or no or at all. Like everything would be chaos and, and constant chaos or non-existence, coming in and out of existence all of the time. That that for me would no, constitute okay. the existence of no you don't God. Know that that would be for no God. You don't know that you don't know that that would be that would falsify God if we had a completely chaotic universe that obeyed no laws. It could be a universe created by a mad god or a god with a weird sense of humor. Exactly, that's the point. But coming in and out of existence, it will be the biggest chaos. A chaotic universe would not falsify a god. So it is not. What I mean, chaos is like Uh, coming in and out of existence at any given second. Yeah. Okay. uh, If in such a universe, uh, life as we know it wouldn't be possible, so we wouldn't be here, and um, it's a null point. It yeah. is a point that makes no sense. It isn't a nonsense. Exactly there. the point. Yes. Atheism doesn't make sense. Atheism no, doesn't, doesn't make sense. Also, atheism doesn't make sense. Atheism is, as Martin said, atheism is just a, atheism is just a stance where you say, "I don't believe in a god." And it's not saying yes or no to there being a god. It's just saying, "I don't believe that there is enough evidence for a god." I'm not rejecting a god. I'm just saying, "I don't believe in a god." Yeah. What you're describing is what describing is what people would call um, anti-theists, people that have a certain belief that there is no God. That's not what atheism is about. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, thanks for the call, Subs, here. We do have other people waiting, so thanks for calling in. Uh, just while we're bringing in the next ca- uh, next caller, uh, or is there another caller coming in? Yeah, there will be, a, but um, I think there was a question that I, Martin was going to answer from the chat room, wasn't there? Oh, well, Stephen Tennessee uh, just asked me really quickly about uh, my own uh, religious background. Um, um, I can just mention really quickly, I was, I was raised in, in the church, and one uh, fact that some people find uh, very interesting when I, I tell them about uh, this period of my life, which pretty much kind of went up to my adolescence, was that I don't have any unpleasant memories or experiences of, of a, uh, a Christian upbringing at all. You know, some, some atheists... Uh, have unpleasant memories, but I don't have, I have nothing, but uh, I remember having a lot of fun uh, doing church activities uh, with the youth group, going to, I went to camp one summer where I saw absolutely the most brilliant uh, exercise in crowd manipulation from the youth minister uh, at, at uh, yeah, I can talk about that someday. Um, didn't realize what that was at the time, but I realize it now, and I realize how good it was, even though what he was doing was incredibly evil, but it was brilliant. Um, so, uh, you know, I had a Christian upbringing, and it was simply uh, a matter of when I 
uh, entered my uh, teenage years just thinking about things more and asking questions and not getting satisfactory answers to those questions. And um, so it was a journey. You know, uh, atheists don't have our own uh, anti-Damascus moment where we suddenly, you know, see see the light of reason and uh, immediately deconvert. Um, it's it, it usually tends to be a process, and, and you go through it for a while. But my, my story isn't necessarily much different, I think, from yeah. a lot of people who grew up Christian and are now atheist. Okay, we've got a caller, and he's wanting to talk about Anthony Flew. He was Anthony Flew. He, he was a philosopher, if I remember right. Right. Anthony... He was an atheist philosopher who became deist in his later years. Okay. Okay. And we're waiting on Ron. Hello. Hello, Ron. You're on the show. Ask a question. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Hi. You can Hello. hear me. Should I be turning? Should I be turning my speakers off? Uh, Just mute yeah, the TV. Yeah, you're yes. feeding back. Yeah. Yeah. Switch your blog TV on. Oh, we've lost him. We'll try him once again. No, he's mm-hmm. trying to get back in. Come on. While well, we're waiting, is there any more questions from chat? I don't know. Or... Nope. We could do a... Does anyone want to do a pick a number? Um, 69. Okay. No surprises from one more <laughs> I'm just filling in for Max, man. <laughs> okay, 69. The Bible describes dinosaurs. Job 40. In 1842, <laughs> Richard Owen coined the word dinosaur, meaning terrible lizard, lizard after discovering <coughs> large reptilian-like fossils. However, in the no. book of Job, written... Uh, I think I'll just put that in the chat for you. It's quite long. So it's a dinosaur-related ah. question. This is going to make me violent, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. I think like, I know. Uh, oh, God. Yeah. I'll read it out. The Bible describes dinosaurs, Job. Quote bit. In 1842, Sir Richard Owen coined the word dinosaur, meaning terrible lizard, after discovering large reptilian like fossils. However, in the book of Job, written 4,000 years earlier, God describes the behemoth as the largest of all land creatures, plant-eating herbivore, with great strength in its hips and legs, powerful stomach muscles, a tail like a cedar tree, and bones like bars of iron. This is an accurate description what's the, of uh, what's the, chapter and verse the on largest this? known dinosaur family. Uh, Job, uh, 40. chapter 40, verse 15 to 24. Uh, yeah, okay. that's the quote. Okay, well, mm, that is. Yeah, and your response, Womble? Bollocks. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's be clear. The the blue whale, I think it is, yeah? Yeah. Kitch, one of the biologists will confirm this, is the largest animal that has ever existed. Uh, as far as I know, that's that's... That's correct. It's, it's one of the whales. Yes. I'm not sure if it's a uh, blue whale. I think it's the blue whale because that's the one that they used in um, the one the Star Trek event back in time. Was Star Trek Four? Oh yeah, yeah. the blue that's whale. It. The blue whale. Yeah. yeah. And if the Bible really is referring to dinosaurs here, why doesn't it just tell us about all of them? Yeah. Right? Why exactly. does it limit itself to this this one particular species? Which apparently eats grass as an ox and uh, has it moves his tail like a cedar tree and is really really big. But all we're going to say about him is that he's really really big and he's big. Uh, <laughs> it's, but, I, okay, I think, fine. It, but now, what about what about all the ones that flew? What about the ones in the ocean? What about all the many many different species that we now know of? I would be a whole lot more impressed if Job were telling me about the Triceratops and about the Apatosaurus, and about the T-Rex, and about all the little raptors, and about the plesiosaurs, and being very, very specific, and, well, and I don't getting think, into um, actual taxonomy. I don't know if we've said all this yet, but a lot of people claim that the references to dragons in the Bible are, in the Bible is a reference to the dinosaurs. But, I mean, yeah, it is a bit odd that we don't get any detailed descriptions of um, individual dinosaurs that we know and recognize. Yeah. So it's and just I, like, I, you know, claims that you hear from um, 
Muslims about how apparently there is all this profound advanced science in the Bible. And then you read the passages, and they are these very poetically written passages, which can be wildly interpreted, if you really use your imagination, to, to mean pretty much any number of things. Uh, whereas what you don't get is specific scientific language. What you don't get are, here are some experimental protocols. You don't get anything that a scientist can actually apply to doing science from these holy books. What you get are, you know, these these moments of uh, these literary moments uh, that describe things in wildly interpretable ways. Okay, uh, I think we'll let our extra special guest. Uh, you can pick a number one to one hundred one, Martin. Oh, what are my choices again? It's so difficult. Uh, one to one hundred and one. So. Oh, all right. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, 46. 46. Okay. Oh, this is a, it's a classic one, this. So it's the... It's the time I used to do with Homo Karadaki. No, it's not. But uh, if you look in the chart, in the chat window, Martin, you'll see it come up. Do you want me to read it out again? Yeah. Yeah, one but you can read it out. Okay. The second law of thermodynamics entropy explain psalm quotation this law states that everything in the universe is running down deteriorating constantly becoming less and less orderly entropy or disorder entered when mankind rebelled against god resulting in the curse genesis some numbers romans some more numbers historically most people believe the universe was unchangeable yet modern science verifies that the universe is growing l old like a garment hebrews some numbers Evolution directly contradicts this law. Okay, so... Um, can I address this one? Yeah, it's open to anyone who wants to go for it. Because I have studied entropy as part of my degree, and it's always the fact that they, they have to resort to a simplified, or indeed, to a certain extent, wrong definition of what entropy is. Um, now, entropy is not necessarily disorder... What entropy is, is randomness. So if you imagine um, leaving a pan of water out into the sun, the water turns into a gas. Because it now occupies a larger volume and the molecules have more room to move about, they can become more randomly distributed, and that means that it is at a state of higher entropy. That's a, a fairly simple example. Now, evolution... Well, first of all, to say that entropy did not exist before... Um, man rebelled against God is a bit of an interesting argument because it's entropy which drives just about all chemical reactions and so we have to wonder how it was that um, Adam and Eve's body chemistry worked if they didn't have entropy uh, to drive their cellular processes along um, as for this idea and what they're hinting at here I think is that they argue that the creation or rather the Big Bang was a rather chaotic process and the early universe was um, a high entropy state because it was just a load of gases floating around and that somehow everything now is more ordered. The, in fact the complete opposite is true. The early universe was a state of very low entropy because the only elements were hydrogen and helium and a small trace of lithium. Now when some of those elements are fused into other heavier elements, that actually causes an increase in the entropy because you now have extra elements they can combine in different combinations and so um, there's more randomness in the universe so the energy is increasing. There, there is nothing that we know in science that contradicts the laws of thermodynamics, otherwise they would be under heavy scrutiny. Okay, the, sorry, there was a question for Martin there. How effective is mockery of religion during a debate? Okay, say again, some of that got cut off. Yeah, was, how effective is mockery of religion during a debate? Oh, okay, I see it there. Well, I guess everything depends on context, right? I mean, uh, in a... I don't think that if all you're doing is mocking, uh, you're doing a particularly good job of getting your point across. The only instances in which I have just gone directly into troll mode and mocked someone is when I am trying to make a point about the ridiculousness of the arguments that they are putting forth. 
Um, and, uh, for example, there was a post that uh, I put up on the Atheist Experience blog um, you know, a few days back where um, some fellow wrote us and, uh, you know, to tell us how wrong atheism was, and uh, his, his evidence consisted entirely of reams and reams and reams and reams of Bible quotes. And so Russell responded to him by saying, well, thank you for sharing all of these uh, passages from your favorite book. Uh, let me show you some passages from my favorite book. And then he quoted from Alice in Wonderland. And uh, then the, the fellow didn't get it, right? You know, the point being that, you know, it's a tautology, right? Bible quotes don't prove themselves. And so if you want to say, here, you should believe in the Bible, and let me give you all these quotes from the Bible uh, for why, because the Bible it must be true because it says it is, then, um, you know, it's, it's, it's utterly useless. And, and talking to someone who does not believe in a god by quoting from a book that takes as its premise, this god exists, and here are things that this god says, and here's what he does, and here's what he wants from you. Um, you know, it's no different than it's what Russell calls the Star Trek rule. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're randomly suddenly throwing quotes from Captain Kirk into a discussion that you're having with someone about science or philosophy or what have you, what have you actually brought into the discussion meaningful? Well, really nothing. It's like, well, what does Captain Kirk have to do with anything? He's a fictional character. We're talking about this, that, or the other factual thing. Um, so there are times when, uh, I guess maybe not mockery, but uh, satire, uh, lampooning someone, um, you know, lampooning the absurdity of an argument is a good way to uh, bring its absurdity to light. But, yeah, I mean, if you're just going to be a troll and someone who just flings insults around, I don't think that's effective. And I think that there is a very wrong and unfair uh, stereotype about uh, atheists that, uh, you know, we're, we're just a bunch of uh, um, uh, nasty people out there. Really, you know, Dawkins gets this a lot. You know, he's this, um, you know... He, he, it's automatically assumed by people who, who criticize Dawkins that he is just this uh, just spittle guy who is spewing spittle-flecked angry rants in the general direction of religion. And uh, But if you actually read his books, if you actually hear him lecture, if you actually hear him on stage when he's debating um, you know, a, 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 a bishop or a theist or whatever have you, uh, he, he's always seemed to me just the perfect gentleman about yeah. it. I mean, yes, he is very impassioned about his views, and you see that impassioned side come out. But I think that a lot of times atheists are inaccurately um, criticized simply for being you know, uh, people out there who do. I think that that is a de really a defense mechanism on the part of theists. It's very easy to not have to defend your beliefs against the uh, criticisms of atheists if you can just say, well, these atheists are all jerks. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask you, Martin, what's your most memorable caller that you've ever taken? <laughs> well, okay. Um, well, the uh, I remember uh, not necessarily fondly, but I do. Speaking of trolls, right? <laughs> uh, back way back in the day when Jeff was host and I was co-host, uh, we had a weekly caller, Steve the Creationist. He would call the show every week, <laughs> every week. But um, and. He would do the, the Gish Gallop thing, right? Yeah. He would throw a whole lot of creationist claims at us and you know demand refutations of them. And some we would do and some we would look up. But the thing that would really frustrate us was that once we refuted a claim that he had made, he would call back the following Sunday and not even address what we had been talking about the previous Sunday, the claims he'd made, the refutations that we'd offered. He would have a brand new thing. And it just real the dishonesty of that frustrated us so much that we finally just had to pin it down and say, oh, if you call again today, we expect you to acknowledge the fact that we addressed this thing you brought up. Because otherwise, you're simply wasting our time. And he kind of started doing that. But I think eventually, he wasn't really being serious after a while. I think that he kept calling the show and kept calling the show week after week simply because he knew that he could get a rise out of Jeff. And now Jeff is a guy who will <laughs> yeah. happy, is happy to blow his top and uh, just go off on, and which is fantastic. I mean, you know, we all need one of those, and, and Jeff is very good at that. Um, but after Jeff left, and I took over the host chair, and uh, with Ashley, um, Steve kept calling for a while, 
But then he stopped, and I think it was simply no fun for him anymore because I would just answer his questions, or I would try to pin him down on a point, and I wouldn't really lose my temper at him. I would, I just wouldn't let him get away with his bullshit, and and it's I, so I think he lost interest after a while. But he's the guy I remember. He was our our first real regular troll. Right. There's another question from the room: Has being on the atheist experience ever gotten you laid? <laughs> <laughs> And that's strangely enough, um, that's not Sound of Silence asking that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is isn't, strangely. I missed a trick there. Yeah. <laughs> Do we yeah, really want an answer for that? No, I'm I don't want to get my game away, so okay, I'll just uh, let that be one of those great universal mysteries that you can use your philosophy to uh, <laughs> if you wish. <laughs> but... Um, Suffice it to say, I don't do it for that reason, everyone. <laughs> Although, uh, but it, I put it this way: being on the show has been a wonderful privilege. I have learned a lot. I have, uh, you know, from Matt, from all the rest of the co-hosts, I've learned a great deal. I feel like it's improved me as a person, just in terms of how I think about things, how I interact with others, um, how I how I conduct my life. Uh, and uh, meeting folks now just from around the globe, I just I went to Reason Rally and was just uh, randomly stopped by folks, uh, you know, uh, and who wanted to shake hands and talk for a bit and have a picture taken, and and uh, and just knowing now that there's pretty much anywhere in the world I could go to and and uh, meet people and meet some friends is has been a great feeling, and I feel very privileged to have been part of it for all these years. Okay, uh, I think we've got Ron. He's, well, I'm going to try and get him back, but there was one quite good question from Lazy Tree. If atheism is correct, why do all the cults not stop pouring in? Why do people just do not get atheism? And welcome, Marta Mutt, her Swedish guy. Hi. Oh. Yeah. There. Uh, sorry. Oh. So the question was, if atheism is co correct, then why do the cults not stop coming in? Why do people not just get atheism? And I'll work on getting their collar back. Right. Well, you have to understand there's the cultural aspect, right? I mean, we, so much of us are, we're all, especially in America over here, it is a, a culture completely saturated in religion. You are born right into it, and it's very, very hard to get out of it, and it is simply accepted as the norm. So, uh, and then you have the problem of people simply not being taught such things as skepticism and critical thinking skills and the scientific method and, and how to and why evidence matters things like that and so um, it's so yeah you would think that uh, it would be the rational default position for claims for which you don't have evidence to be skeptical of those claims if somebody getting back to the old used car example wanted to sell you a used car offered you a great price on the used car but told you that you simply had to take him at faith. He wouldn't let you drive it. He wouldn't let uh, you see any mechanics history reports on it. He wouldn't let you see the title. But if you give me $500, I can sell you this really amazing used car. Well, naturally, you would be skeptical of that. But uh, you know, Sam Harris pointed out in his book, the same people who are skeptical about common sense day-to-day -day things willingly suspend their skeptical thinking when it comes to their religious beliefs. You know, uh, the, the same people who would not believe the fellow trying to sell them the invisible used car – uh, are already primed from birth to believe that the holy book on their nightstand is the divinely inspired word of an invisible magic being who created the universe uh, with his mind. Do you think this and is so? That's kind of a that's a cultural uh, bit of indoctrination, and that's why there is that disconnect. That's why there's this compartmentalization of uh, you know a, a lot of people who practice perfectly good reason uh, always leave a little bit of a cubby hole in their brains for that privileged bit of unreason, and that's where religion resides. And so it's hard to get people to break from that. Do you think that people, um, some of the more entrenched uh, theists, see atheism as some kind of yawning abyss? It's rather like the people who continue to refuse that the Earth is round, in spite of the fact that um, it's now been proven beyond uh, all reasonable doubt. They, they, if they admit that they're wrong, or if they admit to themselves that any detail of what they previously believed to be true is wrong, then in, the, in their mind, re reality as we know it comes crashing down. Their entire view is based around the notion that there is a God. I think that can happen for really, really entrenched devout believers. 
uh, one thing that Christianity does that I think is particularly damaging is that it um, has a way of tearing down the, the individual's self-esteem so as to reconstruct it in such a way that Christianity is now the, the root of it. And so the, you get believers whose entire sense of self-worth is reliant upon Christianity being true. And uh, this is why, and, and we, so we hear this all the time from theists. It's like, well, if, if there is no God, then just nothing means anything. And I, you know, my whole life is pointless, and we should just all, you know, throw ourselves off bridges. And it's this, it's this just nonstop litany of meaninglessness and woe. And that is a very deliberate bit of indoctrination. That's what really, I mean, that is how religion just uh, uh, manages to maintain itself down the centuries, down, you know, no matter what other sort of, uh, you know, uh, scientific or philosophical progress, you know, if you want to credit that, that, you know, people make in terms of, you know, using our, let's use our reason to find out how the world really works. That's how religion has managed to stay alive uh, for so long. It's, it's, you know, do you think, looking people on an emotional basis, getting their fear in play. Do you think there's any way of breaking that illusion to people or have, or do you know um, anybody who perhaps on air has um, had that broken in that you can, is there any way to persuade them that life without God isn't meaningless and isn't enjoyable and can be a worthwhile experience? Or is it just, you just have to recount from your own personal experience, you just have to say, well, I'm an atheist and I think life's worth living. Well, I can't really speak for anything else, but my approach would be to try to sort of walk them through it and ask them to evaluate why they think that should be the case. Do you really believe that everything is meaningless if you found out this afternoon that a god did not exist and that the religious beliefs you were brought up in weren't actually true, or maybe they were? You know, maybe ten percent of them were true. You know, maybe or or, or what? Whatever degree you find out you know, that what you believed isn't necessarily real, what would change for you? Would you stop loving your wife? Would you stop loving your children? Would you stop getting? You know, fulfillment out of your job or your hobbies or your friends. Uh, would you? In, would you no longer get satisfaction out of listening to your favorite music or <clears throat> seeing a beautiful painting or a sunset or whatever sort of emo thing? You want to do? Uh, what would really materially change for you? Um, and some Christians might respond to that by saying, "Well, yes, all those things would change," but then that again is the reinforcement of the belief talking. You kind of have to get them to actually apply it. You, you have to get them to sort. Of, and 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 it, I, I wish I could say that there's kind of a, a magic, you know, deconversion spell that that you can use to sort of get people away from that indoctrination. But it's um, ultimately all you can do is persuade them. Just try to think about these things. Just try to think. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You may ask the questions and decide after really sincere self-reflection that you go back to those beliefs. And that that is your choice, and I'll respect your choice. Um, but you know, it's uh, – in the end, I can't it, – it's not so much about giving my own personal testimonial of my godless life because, you know uh, – my life would, isn't necessarily going to – theirs isn't going to necessarily mirror mine if they become atheist, just because we're all different people individually, regardless of what we believe or don't believe. So I would just always try to encourage believers to think. Ask them what they believe, why they believe it, and then when they give you the answer, just keep feeding that but try get them to think. That's really all you can do. Right. I would suggest, actually, that an interesting tactic to, to use with them is to, um, without wanting to sound like I'm trivialising it, is to ask them whether or not their life ended when they found out that Santa Claus wasn't real, when they were children. Because, obviously, you know, children have this belief in Santa that is actually uh, perpetrated by our parents who hide all Christmas presents away, and they put them out um, overnight while the children are sleeping. And then at some point, the parents have to do the thing of saying, well, actually, Santa isn't real. And, you know, that, that gets can be upsetting for some small children or, or, you know, whatever age they're told. So that's always one kind of thing is to point out that actually their life didn't end when they found out that Santa or the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy or whoever you like didn't exist. 
Yeah, and of course, one of the wonderful ironies about um, Christianity is that you can always go right back to Scripture to find uh, these um, very true uh, observations of these things. You know, this whole notion of, you know, when I was a child, I behaved and thought and acted as a child, but there came a time to put away childish things. Um, and of course, the, the wonderful irony of that is, yes, that is precisely the approach to take towards any sort of unproven belief system that you might have, not simply those when you're a child, but because you should never make the mistake of thinking that as an adult you are immune to irrationality. You know, we're simply not. Uh, and even the smartest people can um, you know, think irrationally about certain things and come to wrong conclusions, although they might be very uh, smart and educated and uh, correct about other things that they believe in. So we should never assume that we are that we hit a certain point and we say to ourselves, well, I'm, I'm an adult now and I'm an intelligent adult. Look, I have this... Uh, you know, very successful career, and I, I, you know, I can do complex math problems in my head, so I'm clearly a smart guy, so if I believe in God, it must be true because, you know, I'm not dumb. Well, it, it doesn't, you know, ultimately it doesn't really matter. It just it, it has to do with how you apply the knowledge that you have, whether or not you are still allowing yourself to, to compartmentalize, to make those, to give yourself the permission to make those exceptions uh, to applying reason to certain questions simply because a belief system is comforting to you and you were brought up in it and you'd like to get if you understand that that's what it is fine but don't it go confusing <laughs> believe because it emotionally satisfies you with something that must be true for that reason simply because a belief feels good and makes you happy doesn't mean it's true yeah there was I think there's a question there in the room it's all scientists ask the question of God when they made their discoveries, then why is God such a bad inspiration? Can you say that uh, again? I think... yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if I understand what they're getting at. Is is it the that? I think you missed out a word at the beginning. If all scientists ask the question of God when they made their discoveries, then why is God such a bad inspiration? I well, sure. I really don't think that all scientists ask the question of, if, of about God when they made their discoveries. I have no idea where you got that from. I know, I know. I, I mean, I, I've I've been doing some. Um, well, the other day I did some scientific research, um, and I my question wasn't um, in any way or shape or form related to God. It was just a geochemical analysis, and God didn't come into it. Absolutely. And, and also, and, uh, if I may... God being a, a good inspiration for something, uh, the idea of God can be a good inspiration for things, you know, if it leads you into legitimate paths of inquiry. Um, you know, being a good inspiration for something does not automatically translate to it's true. It simply means that it is something that, you know, kicks you along a path in your life that led you somewhere. And, uh, for example, you can take a scientist, let's say this is some sort of scientific question about the nature of the universe. Um, why is there something rather than nothing? Why do galaxies form the way they do? Why are the natural laws of the universe the way they are rather than not? Could a god be responsible? Is it possible that if we peer far away into the deep, deep field that we will see evidence of this being? Um, you know, the, the idea of god can be very inspirational. But as long as you understand that uh, the the journey that you go on, you know, if you're willing to accept that the results may not lead you to that God but something else, and if you're willing when that evidence arises to change your mind in accordance with that evidence, then you're doing it right, whether or not God was your inspiration initially at all. I know, but also uh, we also have to address that God also is a case can be used as a bad inspiration uh, for as an inspiration for horrible things such as um, something as denying kids proper scientific education to murder. Um, that is why it, it it is can be a bad inspiration. Uh, I don't really need to yeah, make yeah, example it can be because. Um you know, because believers sort of make God in their own image, right? So someone who is a racist or someone who is a jihadist or someone who has some really nasty agenda to do nasty things, 
interestingly enough, uh, their god always manages to agree with them and justify and, and give them permission to do these things because they are necessary and they are godly. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah the guy in the, the chat room, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Um, the guy in the chat room uh, mentioned Newton and Einstein and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, okay, I, I don't want to go into the whole what did Einstein believe, but uh, okay, Newton, great example. Newton was a devout Christian, uh, but it wasn't God that inspired him to actually make his discoveries. <laughs> it was curiosity. Well, that isn't that isn't entirely true. I was going to bring this example up. Um, one of the things is that if you ask people how many colours there are in the rainbow, they'll all say seven, and it was Newton that came up with that. Now, mm -hmm. Newton actually kind of fudged it slightly because he wanted there to be seven colours in the rainbow he because seven is a holy number yeah. and six is an unholy number, which is why we have that kind of indigo-violet uh, confusion. I mean, of course, nowadays we don't see... Uh, the spectrum as a set of discrete colours, but Newton wasn't completely averse to, on occasion, superimposing uh, his religious preconceptions on yeah. uh, his discoveries. It's also true that he made a lot of dis um, discoveries and calculations and so on which aren't remembered in the history books because they were religiously based and religiously wrong. Um, for example, he predicted the birth of the second coming of Jesus in 1941, well, it must have passed everybody's notice by. Um, yeah. So but he I'll wasn't averse to mixing He was also an alchemist. He was also a strong believer in alchemy. Yeah. I'll, 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 right, I'll, yeah, okay. he experimented with alchemy. That was another, that's another thing. So. No, if you're going to teach the controversy... Disco why the discoveries that he, had, that he is known for were certainly not related yeah, that, to his... That is uh, what makes the distinction, really. The ones that are forgotten to history are all the ones which were made with religious intentions in mind and have since turned out to be scientifically false. Yeah. But I just want to make the point that... that I mean, there's fairly good reflected. evidence, if nothing else. That... I just want to make the point that scientists are remembered and honoured because of their scientific accomplishments. That is what they're honoured for. Um, it doesn't matter what they believe religiously or whatever. Uh, people can be wrong. Uh, for example, uh, there's uh, one scientist, Kerry. I'm going to pronounce his name wrong. Uh, I'm just, I don't know, people like that. Kerry Mullis. He was the founder of the. He basically founded a very important tech technique in molecular biology called PCR. But he was also a global warming denialist. He. Um, he was an AIDS denialist, but that doesn't take away from his accomplishments. But that doesn't mean we have to take every idea he had seriously. Just because he believed that AIDS does not cause the HIV, sorry, the HIV virus does not cause AIDS. That does just because he believed that doesn't mean that the whole scientific community does. It's all based on merit. So uh, that's why I don't find the idea of uh, Einstein or Newton or whatever believed in a god or or not to be very compelling it's, it's, uh, it's obviously it's the logical fallacy of argument uh, and in the and at the end of the day it doesn't really matter right i mean if we understand that there are scientists out there who have a personal god belief it's not a huge number of them but they are out there but you know people have personal beliefs for personal reasons and uh, you know, as I said, and uh, someone just uh, Hicks in the uh, in the chat room just pointed out, it's like, so what if Newton believed in God? What does it have to do with the science he did? Right? I mean, the science that he did, you know, this is the whole you know co-inventing calculus and you know just uh, formulating you know basic physics and all that kind of thing. You know, these are they have survived to this day because they work, right? I mean, those were the things that he definitely got right. Alchemy was not a thing he got right. That's why no one is still doing it. Um, so there, there is a there's a tangible difference there. Um, people can believe whatever they wish, right? You can you can believe you know in the great green article seizure if you want. You know it, it's it all comes down to if someone is a scientist, and it's a different thing entirely. If someone is a scientist and says I have scientific evidence that I'm willing to prevent present that a deity might exist, okay, well now that's a horse of another color. But um, most scientists do keep their religious beliefs 
very much apart from their science. And again, you know, one uh, you know good example that I would give would be Kenneth Miller, um, who when he is out talking about evolution and he is blowing holes in Michael Behe and the other uh, you know, intelligent design guys, you know he is doing he's doing it on the on on the pure basis of the science. But I guess in order to uh, answer Hicks more succinctly, I guess the reason it matters is because what you do find are believers, and particularly fundamentalist Christians, who make this an issue, and it's it's the whole appeal to authority fallacy at this point. Well, ex-scientists believe in God, so if you trust scientists for what they say about evolution or what have you, then why aren't you trusting them about their belief in God? Well, it's because you know, the one has this vast body of actual experimentation and evidence and data behind it, and the other is a personal belief. And people can have personal beliefs no matter what their profession is. It, it ultimately is what you think you have evidence for. Yeah, and this kind of goes back to what the first caller um, was asking. And um, I would I'd just like to share something that I found at the time and people may or may not be interested in. Um, I looked uh, into the scientific literature for religiosity among scientists. And I've got a paper. I can share the link. Unfortunately, it's not free to access. You need a subscription. Um but um, this, they surveyed about 2,200 scientists, both natural scientists and social scientists. Um, first of all, it was 51% that said they had no religion, by which they meant um, any of the above, namely the theistic religions. I mean, that will include deists, almost certainly. Um, two other interesting facts, they were asked to select which statement most closely applied to them. Um, on average, 31% said, I do not believe in God, and a further 31% said, I do, not, I do not know if there is a God, and there is no way to find out. So I think that um, it shows certainly within the scientific community that it is not something with which they, they think they can answer and not something that they have any interest in answering. Yeah, uh, we've got a caller to bring in. It's Niels in Holland. We've got quite a few questions. So. Okay. While we're waiting, I'm going to post a link here. Uh, we had a caller that we lost earlier who had some questions about Anthony Flew. And uh, there's a really interesting uh, blog post by Richard Carrier back from the time when all of this controversy was arising because Flew was saying that I'm no longer, I've renounced my atheism, blah, 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 blah. And then he published this book with a fundamentalist Christian writer who turns out pretty much entirely ghost wrote the book. But there's some interesting information here uh, uh, from Richard Carrier. Uh, if you want to learn more about the whole Anthony Flew uh, situation, and I will post that link to the chat right now. Okay, uh, Neil's here in the chat, okay. so ask a question. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear yep. you. Okay. Uh, first, a little bit of background. I am not, in fact, a theist. And in my community there, I, I have never actually spoken to anybody who really is one. And you have, you have a question. Um, my uh, preference for science above uh, theism is based on the fact that science leads to more questions. If you find out something, that's that's very nice. But what it leads to is more important than the actual uh, uh, the actual answer. And uh, religion, as I understand it, uh, pretends to provide answers to whatever life is asking of you. But you have to accept it no matter what. Um, have you ever posed such a, uh, how do you say, such a statement to a theist? And how do they respond? Um, they think that's a good thing. So not asking questions is a good thing. Uh, do they say why? I, th I think uh, that... Uh, in my experience, anyway, when uh, when you get a theist to to the point where he says, "Okay, I don't know why, but it is this way. I accept this because whatever, you know, that's just what I believe." Then he feels that he has answers, and uh, he knows everything. Basically, he he feels like he's on top of everything, whereas the atheist. 
or well, atheist might not be the right word here, but the the science scientifically minded person feels that not knowing everything means that there's more to learn, and that's valuable. I hear Christians make two uh, very incorrect assumptions about science and its value. Uh, I, 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 these are the ones I hear most commonly. First off, they, they think it is a weakness of science rather than a strength that science changes its views uh, according to the evidence. Yeah. They don't understand that that's a strength. Uh, they also have this idea. That this is what is I was. A, a basic argument from ignorance fallacy, which is that if science doesn't have a, a, a uh, an immediate answer to X mystery, then the religious answer is true by default, and that's not the case either. But those are the two most common misunderstandings of science and how it works that I hear coming from theists. This is what I was. Um, that's what I was saying to Martin earlier. Is that to a lot of people. Um, it's a real crisis moment if they admit to themselves that anything that they previously believed. I mean, for a lot of moderate theists, it is quite often the case that they are encouraged to question their beliefs and so on. But for a lot of the more radical uh, theists, they are often of the opinion that they cannot be wrong, or any detail of their holy book, for example, cannot be wrong, because if you don't know, or if you know that that's not true, how do you know that anything else in the Bible is true? And I've, and Yes, it's this mentality that as soon as you open any part of that belief system to doubt, then it potentially throws the whole thing into doubt, and that's not a desirable, desirable position if it's something on which your entire worldview hinges. And if it's something on which you have had an entire lifetime of fear indoctrination uh, regarding the ultimate fate of your eternal soul, right? Um, mm -hmm. This idea that, oh, well, you, first you're afraid that if you uh, reject the beliefs, then you'll go to hell. But then you have to realize, oh, but wait a minute, if these beliefs are, are in fact not true, then there is no heaven, there is no hell, and when I die, that's it. I simply rot and decay and become worm food, and that's somehow even worse and scarier, and I can't comprehend not existing. It's a, it, so there are a great deal of basic existential fears that religion, especially Christianity, um, gleefully exploit in order to keep believers compliant and, and, and get them to resist um, any sort of evidence that might make them stray, and it's an extremely powerful, uh, you know, uh, psychological wall that gets built. That's hard to break down, and certainly hard for the believer to be willing to break down. Okay, if, if I'm asking another, hopefully short question, yeah, because sure. I, I understand all the answers and the, I agree, but uh, apparently sometimes uh, the theists claim that. The, the, for example, the Bible and the Quran have uh, scientific uh, answers, which, which they say uh, their uh, belief discovered first. However, as far as I know, uh, nothing in either the Bible or the, or the, or the Quran uh, directly led to a scientific discovery or something that could be proven to be a scientific discovery before it was discovered otherwise. And to those theists who claim uh, both a belief and uh, science as part of their belief, uh, how do they respond that their beliefs never actually lead to anything new? Uh, I'm going to direct you to a really, really excellent YouTube channel. Uh, the name of the channel is The Islam Miracle. It's all run together as a single word. The Islam Miracle. And I actually found out about them through Richard Dawkins' website, and they have produced a very elegant series of short videos um, that help to de debunk this idea of you know, a, a, a wide array of uh, ahead of their time scientific facts that were revealed in the Quran that actual scientists only discovered later, etc., etc. Um, and then I'm also going to repeat something that I said uh, sort of at the beginning of the show when we were talking that you might have missed is, you know, what's the good, what's the use of having an ancient holy book full of this, uh, all these brilliant scientific facts if uh, the people a thousand or fifteen hundred or more years ago weren't actually able to apply them? You know, I mean, I, yeah, I would be really, really impressed if, you know, back in, you know, about one or two millennia ago, anyone was able to consult a, a, a piece of holy writing and say, oh, well, here it is right here, you know, a cure for smallpox. 
It's a complete recipe. We'll just follow the instructions, and no one will ever get sick and die from this again. You know, that would be one thing. But not opening up a holy book, reading uh, elaborate poetic passages that can be wildly interpreted uh, in, in any number of ways, and, and then trying to call that scientific writing. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just not what it is. That's you applying what we all know now in a post-scientific, in a post-enlightenment age. You're now applying that, and that's where we actually got the knowledge. And now you are taking that, and you are attempting to retrofit ancient holy writings so that they com- conform to that. And they, they now say what we know to be true, not from studying the Bible, not from studying the Quran, but from doing actual science. And it's it's a complete it's a appallingly dishonest. Yes. So uh, if you, if you give this rebuttal, uh, is the the response anything more than nah? Did, did I'm sorry, I did, did, didn't really understand. Go is it, say that well, again, please. Uh, when when you you speak to those theists and you say uh, you're just uh, reinterpreting uh, in in your in the way you like best. Um, do they ever give anything in an answer to that, other than uh, "No, you're wrong. Uh, my book is right." Well, I'll admit that it's not the most common discussion that we have with believers when we're you know, dealing in email or on the show or the blog or what have you. But it does come up occasionally. But what the approach that I usually try to take is: let's go through this passage. Then let's read it out. Let's see what it all means. And okay, now that we've read it, do you think it really means what you think it means? Why do you think that? Why do you think that this particular language, this this particular poetic passage, is referring to this specific scientific idea that you want to say it represents? Why? Now show me the application. Assuming it's true, I, I try to walk them through it. Okay. And uh, and a lot of time, and they the, and they can't really walk through it, and then they accuse me of just being close-minded and stubborn, which is what you usually get. Um, so. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was going to say we can. Do you want to pick a number, Marty? Seeing as you're the new one here. Oh, okay. It's one, uh, one to one hundred and one. Okay. Um, is forty-two taken? Nope. No, it isn't. Uh, wow. I'll copy it, copy and paste it into 69 the chat. 69 went first. And I think, because we're enjoying it so much, Womble, you can read it out again. Oh, okay. <coughs> 42. The Bible warns against eating birds of prey, Leviticus, the random numbers of gibberishness. Scientists now recognize that those birds which eat carrion, putrefying flesh to you and I, Often spread diseases. Hmm. Right, the first thing I've got to do is look up the biblical passage in itself. I, I think you should. I think yeah. you should work for, for for BBC. I think you should do a book at bedtime. You're really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, it says, oh, and the these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten, and they are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, and the buzzard, the kite, and the falcon after its kind. Every raven after its kind. The ostrich. The ostrich doesn't eat carrion. And the short-eared owl, the seagull, and the hawk after its kind. I don't think seagulls eat carrion either. Um, the little fowl, the fisher owl, and the screech owl. The white owl, the jackdaw, the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron, they don't eat carrion. Um, the hoopoe and the bat. Well, the bat isn't even a bird. Um, but <laughs> first of all, it was in fact Charles Darwin who made quite an extensive study of eating his way through the animal kingdom and recording what they were like. And many of the uh, birds of prey he found to be quite delicious. Um, I don't quite know where they got this claim from because any um, any well dressed bird should be safe to eat as long as you don't have any contents from the uh, digestive system um, it should be perfectly safe to eat and if it's cooked properly as well 
I think that they're. I, yeah. I mean, I like I look at a lot of these birds of prey. I mean, whoever really just looked at an eagle or a falcon and you see that enormous razor sharp beak and those talons, and they look at you and they glare at you. And my response to that is, you know, I'm just not going to try to eat you. I, I'm <laughs> fine with that. I'm gonna I'm gonna go and get myself a nice harmless dumb chicken. <laughs> But here's another then, thing. If the Bible had said that those birds spread disease, that might have given some credence to this, but that's not what it says. But even if it had said that, that, would, that could simply be, uh, have, have been put in there uh, by you know, the, the, the scribe or the writer making the very obvious observation that, oh, here are carrion birds eating corpses uh, on, 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 on the side of the road, I would prefer not to eat the thing that's eating this horrible decaying corpse. True. Yeah, I suspect it may well have been some kind of a superstitious thing that the fact that corpses were full of some kind of dark magic or something and these birds were ingesting it. Um, I mean, I, it, we have to also remember that it's, it might not have been impossible for people at the time when this was written or commanded for them to realize that eating particular things made them ill. Um, Shellfish being a prime example that Leviticus tells you not to eat shellfish, and it's far from, and pork being the other one, and it's far from impossible to imagine that um, there would have been a high incidence of food poisoning associated with them in those days with no proper sanitation or anything. So it's hardly claiming any kind of divine knowledge which couldn't have been figured out at the time. You know, what's uh, also interesting that you ha we shouldn't forget is that. Um you know, there are religions out there that have dietary laws as part of the religion. And, uh, for example, Judaism. And I just, uh, I, I just went to a page right now, um, you know, Judaism 101, uh, where they talk about the laws of kashrut, you know, their, their Jewish dietary laws. And I'm just reading some interesting bits here. It says, um, uh, many modern Jews think that the laws of kashrut are simply primitive health regulations that have become obsolete with modern methods of food preparation. There is no question that some of the dietary laws have some beneficial health effects. For example, laws regarding kosher slaughter are so sanitary that kosher butchers and slaughterhouses have been exempted from any USDA regulations, although I don't think that should be the case regardless. So that's, that's religious privilege at play there, but in any event... Going on, it, but then it goes on to admit, however, health is not the only reason for Jewish dietary laws. Many of the laws of kashrut have no known connection with health. For To the best of our modern scientific knowledge, there is no reason why camel or rabbit meat is any less healthy than cow or goat meat, etc. So, so, you know, there are, um, there, these are just traditions that are getting passed down, and so, you know, if, uh, if your rabbi or your minister uh, is telling you, well, we don't eat X in this belief system. I guess if you're if you're a if you're a convert, you say, okay, well fine, I guess I have to accept that. And um, you know, whether or not it really makes sense to you, but it, in the end you you can say, well it's pretty harmless I can do that. So, although I do remember living in Dubai uh, when I was a little boy and we had a houseboy at the time. And um, we would catch him during Ramadan uh, sneaking food out of the fridge. So they're not always incredibly strict about their observation. <laughs> Okay. I will just say for the record as well, ostrich is delicious. I recommend you try it. Yeah, it is delicious. Um, uh, I think you get to pick a number now, Sounds. I don't think you've had Yay! Uh, have we done 17 yet? No. No. Nope. Can we have 17, please? Okay, and get your narration voice ready, Wombo. <coughs> I've cleaned my fight, especially for you. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Okay, I'm lazy tree. Lazy thing. tree. Uh, hang on, lazy tree asked a dumb question. Oh, um, why hasn't Matt? Dill why hasn't Matt Dillahunty done a show for so long? Is he converting away from atheism? As a matter of fact, he is not. He hasn't done a show for so long because he has been Ooh. out traveling on the debate circuit, uh, beating theists into jelly on podiums uh, in public appearances and public debates. He is actually doing the show again next Sunday. And um, when he was a Christian, he was actually probably a lot more knowledgeable about the beliefs uh, than you were. So um, he is far less likely to reconvert to Christianity because when he was a Christian, the reason he deconverted was because he took the mandate in 1 Peter 3.15 seriously. Always be prepared to have a reason uh, to de and uh, be prepared to give a reason to defend your beliefs. And... Uh, you know, perhaps, Lazy Tree, if you had been doing that, you might not have gotten kicked out of the chat room. <laughs> yeah, he just bored me. Anyway, should we um, 
and get with this question. I think we've just been featured on Blog TV. So just hey. Do you, yeah, um, what on earth is... Who the hell is Spartan J? Uh, oh, I think I... we might need to do a bit of... We might be being spammed. Yeah. Yeah, they obviously think trolling with logic means that we're a troll central. Um... <sighs> All right. Troll. Um, I think we all ignore them for a minute and see if they go away. They will eventually go away. Anyway, I'm going to get. uh, No, see, I'm now because I have to do it. I'm not having a success in my farmer accent. I can talk like this and I can get back in my farmer accent. (laughs) So here I am, especially Riggs, in my farmer accent. The universe had a beginning in Genesis, who are some numbers for Hebrews as well from numbers. Starting with the studies. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go off accent. Oh, <laughs> doesn't matter. Pressure. I should go back to this one because I <laughs> never can do this one. The universe had a beginning. Genesis one, one and Hebrews one and some more numbers, which we don't really need. Starting with the studies of Albert Einstein in the early 1900s and continuing today, science has confirmed the biblical view of that the universe had a beginning. When the Bible was written, most people believed the universe was eternal. Science has proven them wrong, but the Bible correct. Um, wow, that was wrong in so many ways, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> when the Bible was written, pretty much everyone believed that some uh, supernatural thing had poofed the world into existence by magic. And I think like the there ancient been, Greeks, a lot of some of the ancient Greeks at least, believed in an eternal universe. Yeah, but doesn't that is about I, as good as I can get them. I can't remember who came up with which dates. There was somebody who think, thought that the universe was about a million years old. Some of the other Greek philosophers thought it was eternal, but it's certainly not true that everybody thought that. Um, at the time. I'd say that most people believe that the universe was eternal, and that is completely wrong. Most also, people had a religion back in those days, and I don't know of a single religion that says that the universe was eternal. But also, and it goes on to say, um, science has proven those claims wrong. Well, that is the point of science. You know, perhaps the science at the time, although it was a rather different flavor of science from what we enjoy today, um, said that the universe was eternal. That is how science works. Bad ideas get overturned. Um, as for the current thoughts on the origins of the universe, I think it is I think a lot of physicists would say it was wrong to say that the universe had a finite beginning Um, because all we are able to do at the moment is peer back until the first few milliseconds of the Big Bang. We can't see further than that. It's rather like if you've ever seen a graph of an exponential function it gets it, as you go further to the left. It gets closer and closer to the zero line, but it never ever touches it if you continue it to infinity. And it's the same with the universe. We can keep looking back further and further and further, and the universe contracts smaller and smaller and smaller. But we still don't know what happened before that. So, there. So it is certainly not scientific to say in absolute terms at this stage that the universe had a definite beginning. There's also the, the question of how the universe would be defined, because I'm fine with saying that time had a beginning and space had a beginning, and you know we, we can simply infer this from looking at those exponential curves and, and uh, you know talk about the limits uh, of the density or the volume of the universe, but um, even but if the- time began that. So what? Couldn't the universe have existed in a timeless state prior to them? Of course. Well, exactly. I mean, and that's also, the Big Bang is defined as an expansion of space-time. It doesn't necessarily say that space-time didn't exist before that. We don't yet know. Um, and it and it could well be that in the um, the contracted state of the singularity, that time was at a snail's pace or non-existent. Um so we still don't know is the short answer. Okay, I think the I'm, I'm, stopped, yeah. I'm starting to notice in a trend that some of these uh, some of these points is that they're very, very stupid. 
Okay, uh, well, I've got that lie. I can't remember what is it is. Uh, you're being accused of bullying Womble constantly here. <laughs> so, uh, Martin, pick a number. I think we've got rid of the trolls now. So. A number from 1 to 100? Yeah, 101. Yeah. Oh, to 101. Uh, 38. 38. 38. So. Oh. Okay, Womble, are you ready? Yep. Origin of the major language groups explained. Genesis 11. After the rebellion at Babel, God scattered the people by confounding the one language into many languages. Evolution teaches that we all evolved from a common ancestor, yet offers no mechanism to explain the origin of the thousands of diverse languages in existence today. To yes, speak to one of our operators, press one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it, it seems like you could just do a simple Google search for evolution of language and uh, come up with some facts about that. You know, there are, um, you know, there, there's uh, you know, there are a few uh, ideas about how it happened. You know, um, let's see, there's uh, the possibility that language was um, just an adaptation. It was evolved adaptation when when we ended up, uh, you know. Uh, Forming into uh, family units and groups, and then larger communities. So, you know, there's a selection pressure uh, towards improved communication between people. Um, so there are uh, so th there are actually studies that are being done on this. It's not like these are unanswered questions. You get a lot of these from creationists, you know, people who just um, you know hear a Bible story that seems to give a, a simple answer to something, and they just decide without actually uh, doing their homework. Uh, that, that science has not answered this question, and therefore um, we have to take the biblical account seriously. When all you'd really need to do is just um, do your... It, it, it never ceases to amaze me how many questions that we get just in email come from people where all I've had to do to find the answer to their question was freaking Google what they asked. <laughs> it's not hard to yeah. do. You know, Google is your friend. It loves you. It wants you to use it. <coughs> just figure it out. Uh, and yeah, I also find... That, that, that I also get the same question with the evolution of sex and it's just a simple Google search away uh, yeah that's I mean one of the, oh yeah. sound no sorry um, I said that, that was it oh. well no just to say that um, science cannot explain the evolution and diversification of languages as we know them that Really isn't true. If you it, again, it won't take very long on Google to find um, about find out about this. We have already drawn a fairly skeletal map of uh, the evolution and divergence of language, and in certain cases, we can show at what point a language diverged from another, and that is getting fleshed out by the day. Um, for example, just about all the European languages can stem back to um, both Latin and its predecessor. Um, it evolves rather like the way animals evolve, in the sense that geographically isolated groups will often um, evolve their language more quickly and in a rather different direction. Um, and you could just simply by looking at the words and finding their roots and so on, you can uh, both cross reference that with who invaded who at what point in time and how the language exchanged, and simply which languages are descended from which. So we have a, a fairly cohesive answer already, and it's growing every day. And I can pretty much willing to bet that none of those uh, hypotheses have languages just spring out of nowhere around the same time as this supposed uh, Tower of Babel was supposed to have been uh, going on. Well, indeed. I mean, again, it's also it's another one of the things that... Um, sort of reinforces the notion that we um, evolve from African peoples, that if you actually trace the linguistic tree back to its very base, it does go to Africa. And so Africa could be considered as the Tower of Babel in a scientific sense. Um, and it may well be that that is the origin for that. I mean, I can't think who would have been writing this stuff down um, at the time. 
but it you know it's it's a better explanation than to believe the biblical account and of course there's no there are no um relics of the tower of babel left a lot of people put it in china but they never actually you know there's no site named for, for it Okay, we had a question from chat uh, from Shy Name, and the question was from Martin. And the Martin, um, yeah, the Shy Name was curious as to what was going on today in um, the atheist experience. Uh, today, Jen and Russell are hosting. Uh, I'll probably be watching uh, the Ustream. Uh, so, um, if after we're done, if everyone wants to head over there, uh, you know, feel free, do it. Um, it's a lot of fun. It is possible that we will be getting a call from a notoriously aggravating uh, fundamentalist troll who calls himself Parchor. Oh, yeah. I think I remember. And, uh, yeah, he, he came back. and I don't know why. He, I, he, you know, he's like, uh, it's like herpes, right? He sort of pops up when you least expect it, and it's very inconvenient and annoying. Um, I don't know why he suddenly uh, raided our inboxes again yesterday. He sent us the, this flurry. He does his usual thing of sending a bunch of trash-talking emails, asking amazingly dumb questions, and then we refute them, and then he says we didn't refute them. He's, he's, just, he's, he's as dishonest as the day is long, but um, I finally blocked him because I was tired of dealing with him. But he says he's insisting on calling tomorrow. Russell is uh, today. Russell isn't keen to talk to him, but I think Jen wants to beat him up a little bit. So yeah. that could happen, and that could be some fun. But uh, when it starts, I'm sure I'll be watching on Ustream. Um, also, um, Stephen Tennessee asked whether or not it's possible to give a Spartan J a shout out. Um, I think it's just after the in joke moment. Yeah. Um, from the, the, the yeah. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not on the show today, and you know what? I have absolutely no idea who Spartan J is. And um, <laughs> at this point, I don't know. Uh, we need, not, I don't know if not, you the chat we had, um, I think it was when, when um, the show got featured, we had a load of trolls just pour in, and they were all going about Spartan J. Um, yeah, uh, which uh, I, I have no idea what that was all about. I figured it's an in-joke that I missed, but uh, or who knows. Mm, I, but no. uh, I'm not on the show today, so I can't really do anything about that. But uh. Uh, I actually just took the liberty of just looking up who he is. All I keep on coming up uh, in the Google search is just game videos, so he's just uh, a gamer, as far as I know. Oh, well then I think they're barking up the wrong tree on this show. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Catch a uh, number, please. Uh, sure. Uh, I'll go with number 23. Well, this is quite a good one. And, I hope so. Uh, do the honours womble. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> oh, interesting. Hicks is going to love this one. Sexual promiscuity is dangerous to your health. From Corinthians and Romans, the Bible warns that he who commits acts of... Uh, he, he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body and that those who commit homosexual sin would receive in themselves the penalty of their error. Much data now confirms that any sexual relationship outside of holy matrimony is unsafe. Well, all right then, let's just legalize gay marriage and we take that problem away. (laughs) Solved. I'm surprised it doesn't go on to say that masturbation makes you blind. Um, but <laughs> or leaves you with hairy palms. I mean, we need Lacey Green, really, for this. But to say that all sex out of marriage is unsafe is absolute rubbish. It is perfectly possible to be responsible um, in terms of um, being, well, sexually promiscuous. I'm not sure people think of it in that context when they're doing it. But... Um, you know, simply by making sure that you and your partner are tested regularly. Obviously, people haven't had that luxury throughout history. Um, but it is certainly possible to not contract sexually transmitted infections by sex outside marriage or by homosexual acts. Obviously, people who are more sexually promiscuous are prone to getting these things. But again, that is also something that sh- which could have been known when these passages were written. And I just want to say... Um that yeah that um what is what what mechanism 
does marriage have to prevent sexually transmitted diseases? Well, uh, you precisely. Could be in a life, you could be in a committed relationship and be perfectly safe uh, as someone who's in a uh, an in a marriage. Um, some people just don't get married because they just don't believe in the institution. They just don't see the point in it, and they're perfectly fine. They're not, they're perfectly safe from sexual diseases as long as there is no uh, cheating. But uh, that's the same same thing happens in that. That's the same risk in marriage. Uh, there's no inherent uh, protection just because you have a a gold ring around your finger. It's not. And, and I'm also, I, I never cease to be amazed at just how little Christians reveal that they know about um, the the history of not only just their own religion, but um, just Western culture, civilization in general, in regards to how marriage was done and has, has historically been done. They seem to have this assumption, and, and these are especially like the sexual moralists, right? The people who are all about you know, sex outside of marriage is bad, and gay people are sinning, and it's all evil and horrible and wrong, and and, and so and it's all and marriage is they say this in America, which is just sort of like you know it's, it's, it's American Christians are especially just the stupidest because they'll say the Bible says blah, and they're like, well, no, it doesn't because <laughs> uh, and aren't you supposed to have read it? Um, you know, the, the, this idea that uh, marriage is the holy matrimony, it's one man, one woman, and that's uh, just, and it's a godly mandate and what have you. There's really nothing really quite like that. And also, um, you know, the, you know, the God of the Bible, in the old, you know, and, and you always get the, oh, well, that's just the Old Testament uh, excuse when you bring this up. But, you know, the God of the Bible advocated mass rape. Uh, he was perfectly okay with, uh, Lot's daughters getting him drunk and fucking him uh, after they escaped Sodom and Gomorrah. They, uh, you know, there's all sorts of crazy uh, sexual activity um, that uh, there are scriptural mandates against uh, that are held. You know, the, the Bible holds that it's unclean to have sex. You know, like like in terms of you'll get infected, you'll get girl cooties if you have sex with a woman while she's on her period. All of these ideas that we now know are complete rubbish. But again, this I this whole notion of what marriage is meant to be in the biblical sense. Um, if you want a... You cannot get a more Christian culture than medieval Europe, right? I mean, that's about... Yeah. I mean, there's people talking about Christian nations, and they, you don't get much more Christian than that. Uh, yeah. And in that culture, it would not have been unusual for a guy my age, and I'm 46, to be on his fourth or fifth 15-year-old wife. Right, I mean that's just kind of you know there's a death and childbirth was a common thing and what have you. But you know if you talk to a Christian these days and and ask them in all honesty, all right, some some guy some middle aged guy comes to your door and says, I want to ask you for your teenage daughter's hand in marriage. You know, you you would probably be you know slightly appalled. You might call the police. You might just shoot him right there on your doorstep. But the point is. 500, 600 years ago, 700 years ago, in Christianity-saturated medieval Europe, this was a common form that marriage took. Marriage also, uh, depending on your class, had nothing to do with romantic love. It had to do with uh, forming political and or business or otherwise, you know, the bonds between families. That was a motivation for marriage. So, so this whole idea that 20th, 21st century marriage... Uh, is is how it always has been. It just reflects pure ignorance of history. I will just quickly say as well that there is absolutely nothing in the Bible that um, promotes monogamy exclusively. In, or that is to say, there is no commandment in the Bible which is against polygamy. Um, I mean, it is uh, it is true that uh, as you said there's quite a lot of incest in the Bible, but I've been told I've not checked this out, but it, there is a supposedly a passage in the Bible that around the time of Jesus it was the rules were changed such that you could no longer do some of the things that had happened in the Old Testament. But certainly there is nothing in either Testament about multiple marriages. So it's not just about um, marriage, it's, a, it's still a case of sexual promiscuity. You can, you know, you can still, there's no, different, there's no difference between uh, performing adultery with many women or, marriage, or marrying many women. You're still going to be 
an equally live breeding ground for sexually transmitted diseases. And I, I just also find it uh, pretty interesting. Um, it's just maybe it's just for me uh, being in Ireland, and it's mainly Catholicism that I have to deal with. That uh, the people who often make this claim uh, also are against the one of the main forms of preventing uh, the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases, contraception. Yes. Uh, so they oh, are. Yes. They are. They are uh, basically preventing. The one way of pre- of, uh, of preventing uh, sexually transmitted diseases from being tra- from being spread, and this is very this is obviously completely and utterly um, devastating in places like Africa, where AIDS is AIDS is at very high frequency. Um, I mean, I believe that things have changed now, but it used to be the case that the current Pope would actively spread the lie that the use of contraceptives like condoms and femidoms actually increased the spread of HIV. Rather than simply saying um, condoms are against our religion and we propose that you consider abstinence first, they would actually go out of their way to poison the well against these things. I will, I will say here and now that abstinence is and will always be the best um, form of contraceptive. But, um, yes, it, they, it's unbelievable the amount of damage those kinds of lies, and there's no other word for it, um, have been perpetrated by the Catholic Church. Uh, but uh, the one thing I always say when the Pope is going on about sex is that it, it, here, if, you don't make the, if you don't play the game, don't make the fucking rules. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's just reminding me of a joke from Red Dwarf um, about um, something when they're saying that something's as useless as a condom machine in the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could really make a very poor t- a joke and poor taste, but I'll leave it for after the show. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll wrap it all up there. So many, many thanks again, Martin, for coming on. It's been fantastic. It's been a lot of fun. It's a real great pleasure to meet all of you. I really enjoyed it, so I hope you all stay in touch. Oh, yes, we definitely will. And uh, just, yeah. to, just to let everyone um, know that in two weeks we're back with a very special show. Um, like I said, we've had Martin on, so we're going to the other end of the curve now. Uh, Kirch, I'll let you announce the next show. It's going to be fascinating. Okay. <laughs> okay, Next, ne- the next show, I can see Martin <laughs> <laughs> God, no, he's got me laughing. I know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but they the don't. other end of the spectrum. Oh, it's complete. We have Empty Without Brain debating against D1, the only, the con man himself, the absolute disgusting human being, Venom Fang X. Ooh. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Yes, that's going to be. I, I can already feel the stupid in the pain building. Yeah. <laughs> the topic is uh, a Christian society versus a pluralist society. Um, and I think MTR it, Brain uh, has a made a video. Yeah, and it's going to be a formal debate in a kind of British parliamentary style, from what I understand. But I think there will be questions taken afterwards, so you, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's just going to be interesting. So you might want to see that one, Martin. Yeah, I think I will. Yeah. Okay, everyone, uh, thanks for turning up. Please give a thumbs up for Martin turning up, and it's been great, so everyone. Thank, thanks to you guys again, and I guess it looks like in about an hour and a half, uh, the Atheist Experience will go live, so if you want to watch that on Ustream, just go to atheist-experience.com, okay. and the link should be right there at the top of the page. Yeah, uh, we'll probably yeah. see you in the chat there, so. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right, everyone. Thanks. Good night. And uh, when Skeptic TV on again, just to get your plug in. Yeah, uh, um, we we're, we're, we're having on. a show, our next show on Saturday, and then we are moving to two weekly, um, the standard two weekly format from there. So we just what's your talk? So it's this Saturday normal. coming, not the one after it. Yeah. Yeah, this Saturday coming, and then it's two Saturdays after yeah. that. And your topic? Uh, we are doing UFOs, aliens, and space travel. All right. So, Ooh, yes. Very exciting. Yeah, Martin was just lit up there. So, all right. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Fun. Cheers. Bye-bye.